I think bias is part of the society. You see me, you don't expect much out of me. You see me, you think probably I'm a thug. You see me without knowing me, and I represent this, this thing that people have built about me. You know? It's not my responsibility to think or to react to what people think about me. You know, I am. Um, I am. I am. I am someone that somebody made in a state of love and wanted the best of everything for me. I have a heart that gets hurt and bruised, but you must expose your heart to live. It may be bruised. It may come back bruised after you've shared it. And um, it's far more important to live my life and show my heart than to worry about what other people think of me. If you walk into a room and the room changes, just remember, nothing is wrong with you. Something is wrong with the room. So images have tremendous impact. They, if I may quote the scholar Rudine Sims Bishop, who, who brilliantly uh, ushered in the idea of windows and mirrors. So, you know, windows being that I can look in and see the reality of another culture or experience that is not my own. And I, I think almost more powerful are those mirrors you know, if I see an image, I come to an understanding about what that is about me, be it negative or positive. You know, when there was so much negative publishing happening, you know, again, in the early 1900s, you know, those images were really used to suppress and oppress. You know, they were designed to create othering of people, you know, people of color that, you know, white supremacists wanted to suppress. And when you do that to a child, that is imprinted from a very young age. So I grow up thinking, that's me. You know, I'm, I, I, am, I am little black Sambo. Well, I started researching black imagery, the black figure and imagery, the representation of black people in images, in illustrations, in art, and went down a rabbit hole and followed the images. And there were all kinds of images. There were derogatory images, there were uplifting images, there were historical images, contemporary images. And I started looking at what the images were saying who was creating the images in, at certain times in history. Growing up in Virginia, it was really interesting because none of this was ever discussed. So I never saw any, um, not very many children's books with kids that look like me and artists that look like me. I didn't talk to any artists that look like me. Um, and even going to college, um, there was no ever there was no discussion of black illustrators, black artists, Harlem Renaissance, nothing. So I was embarking on a journey. During the 19th and 20th centuries, widespread published imagery uh, had an impact on the way we think about race in a couple of different ways. In many cases, uh, during, for example, the golden age of American illustration during the 20th century, when there were publications like the Saturday Evening Post and Collier's and Ladies Home Journal that were circulated to a very wide public, essentially people of color were omitted. Uh, or if they appeared on the pages of those publications, they appeared in servile roles. So you can imagine that this kind of presentation over and over again, repeated millions of times to millions of people would have a very impactful way of affecting the way that 
readers saw people of color. In addition, materials from the 19th century and early 20th century in particular uh, portrayed racial stereotypes, either making African Americans appear to be foolish or caricatures of themselves uh, in a way that was highly abrasive and derogatory. Most derogatory images were created for a purpose. And that purpose was usually connected to something that happened in history, like Reconstruction. Whether freed slaves were going to have rights or not, voting rights, rights to move around, rights to move and live wherever they wanted to live. The idea of controlling the image of black people was very important to creating derogatory images that would paint people of color in a really bad light so that people would not think it was a good idea for people of color to vote and to have a say in society. That was one of the things that derailed Reconstruction is um, the illustrations in the Harper's Weekly by Thomas Nast. So it, it made me think about the changing visual voice of Thomas Nast. You know, so you have this whole emancipation double page spread that really beckons the audience to say, oh, look, look at what's going on. It isn't, like, Lincoln is, has freed the slaves and well, this is what's gonna happen and the families and, and then not that long after he starts creating, you know, these really caricature derogatory images of, you know, people, black people fighting in Congress and throwing chicken bones and, you know, it's like, this is what's gonna happen if you don't shut down voting rights. Yeah. In some ways, Americans and American culture and American history doesn't see Asian American history and African American history as intertwined. And so often they don't see the visual representations or stereotypes as intertwined. Because African American, the black and white history of uh, the American history of race is so binary. The photo of the 1869 completion of the Transcontinental Railroad, right, it does not have a single Chinese person in that entire photo, right? So in some ways, the American history of racial representation has been so focused on literally a black and white issue that it erases any other races. And so I'll call attention to the ways in which visual illustration is used to construct all of our notions of race, right? And that the ways in which Asians were figured in American history visually was one that worked towards rendering them invisible, right, as foreign, rather than as, um, sort of sources of power that ought to be controlled and owned in the way that African Americans were figured in their stereotypes. Chinese exclusion, this was this effort in the middle, second, um, from 1865 to 1882, where the U.S. government and U.S. population was really anxious to rid the U.S. labor market of the Chinese who had been brought in by the U.S. government to work on, work on the railroads in particular. And so what happened in, during that sort of 20-year period, there was a lot of really aggressive anti-Asian violence and harassment and a series of laws eventually that resulted first in the 1882 Exclusion Act and then a series of laws for the next 20 to 30 years that were restricting Asian immigration, uh, civil rights, they couldn't own property, they couldn't vote, they couldn't testify against a white person, they couldn't intermarry, they had to stay restricted to st uh, schools within their own race. And so during this time in the 19th century, you can see a lot of sort of political cartoons, Chinese must go, uh, Chinese out, usually with Uncle Sam kicking Chinese, pigtailed Chinese man. There was a, fr a lot of dehumanizing bestial imagery, so commonly sort of trying to show the swarms of hordes of yellow peril arriving Asians as insects who are coming to prey upon 
the sort of healthy American people that was going to be decimated by the swarm of locusts. What I think is fascinating about this topic is even when I was coming of age as a child, there were books around with stereotypes of black children, um, images, right, Aunt Jemima, things that we took for granted, images that even as black people we owned, you know, like if you like Uncle Ben's rice, you don't think I'm not going to eat it because of the image on the cover. And they realized these images were constantly being rethought and re-envisioned. But what happened in this case was the Aunt Jemima, for instance, woman, the image stereotyped a particular person, the African-American woman. She was a maid, she's a cook, you know, she's a domestic, she's a cleaning lady. And so it took years, has taken years, to break out of that stereotype that all African-Americans are relegated to be domestics. These are the sentinels, okay? These are the objects that are standing guard, standing at the gate saying, no, nope, no, nope, never again. We've done this already. We won't do it again. So those images were really relevant to a cause of uh, Jim Crow laws. And because of the violence and because of the lack of rights, people wanted to escape the oppressive conditions and they moved north to the cities of Chicago and Detroit and New York and Philadelphia. I grew up in a very small African-American community in, in Germantown section of Philadelphia. Uh, most of the neighbors um, migrated from the south. The story was part of how we sort of expressed ourselves. Um, we seemed to be isolated from a bigger world, and yet we had the rich world, a rich university of storytelling that joined us with, with our, uh, some sense of our history, our roots. And I think a lot of my art stems from telling stories with a sense of um, expression and emotion, a kind of animation, a kind of energy. And that was, of course, the root in the oral tradition of storytelling. And there they found work, they found better lives, they raised their families, and they maintained presses, and they started creating their own image. And that was known as the New Negro Movement. The person really who wanted to change the image of black people from a plantation image to a more uplifting, inspired image was Elaine Locke. And Elaine Locke hired Aaron Douglas to create a powerful, strong image of black people. And so Aaron Douglas was at the forefront of this image creation. And he created covers for um, the Crisis Magazine and The Opportunity and many others. And they were magazines that were created for the black audience by black editors and writers and artists. And in fact, uh, those publications became uh, an outlet for African-American female illustrators as well such as Gwendolyn Bennett and Lois Mailer Jones, uh, who contributed their work uh, and received wide acclaim. Imagery during the civil rights movement and leading up to it in illustration was vibrant and powerful and colorful. Artists, uh, both black and white, made a commitment to speak out in their work, and uh, those illustrations began to be seen in both niche magazines and mainstream magazines, as well as newspapers and on posters in terms of uh, telling the story of the importance of civil rights for all. During the Montgomery bus boycotts, uh, Dinnerstein and Silverman are following along the news. They're not seeing a lot of images of the Montgomery bus boycotts in the popular press, perhaps because it wasn't the most dynamic scene to show people boycotting buses by walking to work. But Dinnerstein and Silverman decide that this is such an important historical event that they are going to travel south. They spent weeks down in Montgomery chronicling what they saw. 
Montgomery bus boycott turned out to be the seminal event for the civil rights movement. It brought Martin Luther King into it. It brought a lot of uh, black activists who are active in, in uh, civil rights drives in Jim Crow South in 1950s. We walked into what could have been a, a, a very scary situation. Didn't know anything. The drawings turned out to be very important of African Americans that, is, uh, that are sympathetic, that are not caricatured, that are not enhanced. And suddenly we were relevant as artists. We had a place. And clearly as illustrators, you also did. You had a functional role. Somebody in the real world came to you and said, we need you. In the late 1960s, the tone of illustration in some publications, like the Black Panther newspaper, really began to shift. The urgency of the civil rights movement, uh, the challenges that African Americans faced, uh, the violence in our nation, inspired an outpouring of outrage, and imagery began to show that. Artists like Emory Douglas began to express in very strong graphics, combined with uh, some very insightful uh, and challenging text. And they put those concerns front and center in very striking graphic imagery uh, that began to attract a lot of attention. I think that one of the things that Emory was able to do by using illustration instead of photography, because you did see in magazines of the time, you would see photographs, and even in the Black Panther newspaper, you'd see photographs of tenements and roaches, and um, when it's a photograph, it is almost too real, and people don't want to look at it. But what he does in his drawings is that he removes everything extra and focuses in on what's important. So for example, this drawing of the woman with the rat, instead of real rats running around, which most people would find repulsive, it, it's a beautiful drawing and a beautiful rendering, sympathetic rendering of this woman. So he's using illustration at its most powerful to show something in a way that uh, tells a more complete and a more compelling story than reality. I think it's important, especially now, I think museums are becoming more and more open in telling the, 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 the truth story of the, the effects of racism, the effects of, of slavery, the effects of the horrors of the African American experience in this in this country. So, in order for this country also to heal, is to realize, to realize that this is this is what happened. From about the mid twentieth century, it's important to note that artists, illustrators, have really made a concerted effort in their work to ensure that the presence of black people is front and center, is normalized, uh, is celebrated, where artists realize the power that they have to underscore the idea that everyone is equal and everyone has a role in our world. I like to tell the hero's journey through my lens. Um, and my lens is full of people who look like me. I've seen, I've seen the story told through my parents, through my uh, siblings, through friends, through extended family. And that's who you see in my artwork. And I really seek to ennoble people, the subjects in my paintings, to, um, in a way that people can identify it even if they're, they're feeling downtrodden or they feel like they're not really being the hero in their story, when they see my paintings or my artwork, they are reminded of it. They're reminded of the better parts of themselves. If there are people in the room to say, wait a minute, you know, shouldn't we 
think about the story differently? Shouldn't we think about this, this display of images differently? And just thinking about having a diverse room that actually makes the decisions before the images are created. And it's important to, to educate students who are going to be image makers. It's important to do that because they're coming out. They're coming out of school. And this is their, the, these are their platforms. And so whether they're going to be art directors, whether they're going to be editors or illustrators, they need to understand how powerful images can be, how powerful illustration is, and what their role is in it.